Amen. Welcome back tonight to Bible Baptist Church. And I know some of you are here because you love church. Amen. And you love the Lord. Amen. Amen. And you love air conditioning. Amen. Amen. You can count on that. Praise the Lord. It's, it's working. Uh, we're glad you're here tonight. Looking forward to us spending this hour with you. And uh, those of you joining us on Facebook or YouTube, we welcome you as well as we continue to uh, broadcast these messages for those who cannot uh, be with us just quite yet uh, here presently in the service. And so we are had a great day today. A lot of folks on vacation and traveling because parents are anticipating school starting back in some form or fashion in the next few weeks. And so we always get that surge here at the uh, end of summer, folks trying to make those last few trips. And so we're glad you're here and looking forward to hearing tonight uh, from the Lord. And uh, also we're going to hear from some of our teens about the camp that they took part in this last week. It was a real blessing. And uh, we'll share more of that in just a moment. But let's get started with prayer. Again, this morning we had first time guests and friends. And so it's uh, 10 or 12 weeks in a row now that uh, since we've opened up that the Lord has just continued to send us folks. And we appreciate that. And we thank you for being a part of tonight's service as well. So let's look to the Lord in prayer before uh, we sing some more, I believe. So uh, let's pray together. Father, we are rejoicing and uh, thankful today for your blessings in our services and, Lord, for the many families that you sent to be here with us and those again tonight for our worship. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the uh, testimonies of what happened this week in the hearts of uh, young people through this camp, uh, through the messages and just the togetherness that they were able to, to uh, unite as a youth group before school starts and, uh, Lord, just kind of strengthen some things and resolve some things spiritually through that theme that they shared with uh, Pastor Bell. Uh, Lord, we also pray tonight for those families that have lost loved ones, can, especially the Todd family, Lord, and, and others uh, who are grieving during this time and loss of, of family and friends. We pray, Lord, for comfort. Uh, Lord, those dealing with illness or health concerns, uh, Lord, we lift them up to you and ask for your blessing and your touch upon their life. And Lord, we thank you for being so faithful. As we spoke about this morning, Lord, great is your faithfulness. And uh, Lord, we, we, we honor you and uh, reverence you because of that, Lord. And we uh, do not take it for granted. We just know that it's because you love us and because you are ever present. And Father, we ask that you'd be honored in all that is said and done tonight through this service and that you would uh, be uh, glorified, Lord, as we lift up your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, and please be seated.
you so much for singing and participating tonight.
All right. Well, now I get to share with you some fun stuff that we got to do. And uh, here in just a few moments, we're going to show a video. And uh, it's going to make a lot of you jealous of what we got to do this week. Um, but, you know, Pastor said a little bit this morning, uh, you know, things were up in the air. We didn't know what we were going to do. We were going to go to camp with uh, uh, Florence Baptist Temple. They're in Florence, South Carolina. And uh, they kind of waited and waited. And so they finally, we kind of started putting a plan B together. And uh, we met with leaders. We talked with parents. And uh, so we decided, hey, we're going to go with this plan B. And it ended up being a great week. And so a little bit about how we got there is uh, we decided, once we decided a plan B, uh, we decided to go, me and Rachel were on our way to Tennessee uh, to meet with her family, and we were talking about ideas and themes, and so we settled on the theme of resolve. And the main thing we came across was because it's a, a firm call to action. And so we want these kids to be ready, and so uh, then once we had that theme, uh, we started getting our work together, and uh, everything started to come together. And then while we were in Tennessee, we were with my nephews, and uh, they're in middle school age. And, uh, and so I said, hey, who was one of your favorite speakers? And they, they thought about it for just a second, and then they said, Kevin Bell. And Kevin Bell is a, a friend of mine. He's a church planner in Maysville, Kentucky at Faithway Baptist Church. And uh, so I called him, and I said, hey, do you think that you could speak? And he said, well, let me work on it. He said, I'm actually going to be getting back from our camp that Friday, and then I would have to get in the car and drive Saturday, being at week all, there, they were at camp all week. And so uh, he called me back and said, yeah, let's do it. And so uh, it was a great week. Uh, and uh, there was, we did four sessions. Each night we had a service, and it was all resolved. And so the first night was resolved to be honest. The second night was resolved to be ready. Uh, the third night was resolved to be different. And the last night resolved to be surrendered. And each one of these was to be a, this is going to be a firm call to action. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be different. And I'm going to be surrendered. Uh, we averaged 26 during the day, 26 students during the day. Uh, and some fluctuated because some had work or some had different things they had to do and they had to miss a couple days. Uh, and then at, at, in the evening service, we averaged 33 students. Um, and then we had workers. We had lunch and dinner every day. Um, and they, didn't, they did not go uh, with just bad food. They went really well. And uh, I'm thankful for my wife. She's the one that put that all together. They had uh, pizza and tacos and Chick-fil-A and what else? Barbecue, Kevin Thomas barbecue. It was, it was all good stuff. And you're welcome, staff, because they got to partake in the lunch as well. So they didn't have to go to lunch all week. Uh, but we had a really, really good time. Uh, we started with Sunday night with just service. And so just a week ago, we were over in the social hall with service uh, and a great night. And then Monday, you'll see in the video here in just a few moments, Monday was kind of a, a slip and slide, a wet, a wet and wild day. And uh, we had two big inflatable slides um, that I was like, these kids are going to get pretty uh, bummed out on after a while. Nope, they didn't. They just kept going for it all the time, all day long while we had them. And then we had slip and slide kickball. And so I, I had Pastor Dwight go get me some big tarps, and he bought black tarps. That was smart. Um, it was like boiling water by the time they slid across it, but they're teenagers. It's okay. And that softball field, just to let you know, is full of stickers, and they were barefoot. So good luck to them. Um, and then the second day on Tuesday, or the third day on Tuesday, it was when we went down and did the officers, and we did the four precincts. And, uh, and then Friday, or Wednesday, it felt like Friday by the time we got to Wednesday, uh, we went to Fun Zone. And so um, I saw all the evil in go-karts come out of our kids. Um, and a lot of me, too. It was like, poof, poof. and I told them not to bump, but I was the one that was bumping. Um, but we had a really, really good time. And uh, I, I told this to the staff. Uh, to me, this is one of the greatest camps I've ever been a part of. It was amazing. And a lot of it has to do with our kids. Our kids just come, and our kids are, just want to be together. They just want to hang out. Uh, I could have done a service project every single day, and we would have had the same kids show up. We would have had a great time with it. They uh, made the uh, project with going out to the officers. They made that fun. Um, they got T-shirts and cups and pins and hand sanitizer, so they got something out of it too from the police department, so that was awesome. Um, but our kids are just awesome, and so it was bittersweet for me uh, and for Rachel. This is our last camp with them. Um, and so it was a really, really good time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, them show the video, and then we're going to have some testimonies, all right?
great week and uh we we will post a picture but there was a picture at the end of the week that we had the entire front was full of different decisions that were made um to be honest to be different um we had two salvations uh we had several people that hey i want to get baptized or uh just reassurance uh assurance of faith and so it was really really awesome for us and so um i've got a couple students that are going to come up so i'm going to have first have Caden McInerney Come on up. Now you can't preach. Alrighty. Well, I didn't really write anything down because I figured I would just talk about uh, the week and what it meant to me. But Michael mentioned we had like a different theme every day, but the main theme was resolve. And each night we reminded ourselves, what does resolve mean? And the speaker, Kevin, said, resolve is to firmly decide and to stand strong. And I thought, man... What does our church need more than, you know, just the church as a whole, the nation, uh, to decide and to say we're going to stand for what's right and we're going to firmly decide on our beliefs. And so that was good. And then um, personally, I decided to, I resolved to share the gospel more because I realized how easy it really is. Um, God gave us a mouth to speak and he gave us legs to walk with. And that's really all you need to share the gospel. Um, and so that was what was laid on my heart this week. And then the last night he did an illustration, and it was resolved to be ready, or, yeah, surrender. And one night he talked about um, just like sharing the gospel, and he did an illustration with um, a bunch of tickets. And he said, all right, so you're, somebody gave you all these tickets. They gave you like 100 tickets, and each was a ticket to your birthday party. And at this birthday party, somebody was going to give you a million dollars. How many tickets would you give out? And... He used little Kevin Thomas, and he said, oh, you're going to use all of them, right? You're going to give all your tickets out. And what hit me was so many times we just walk around with all the tickets stuffed in our pockets um, when those tickets are worth so much more than money. Those tickets are worthless. They have no worth because they're priceless. So that's what stood out to me. Um, when I get to heaven, I don't want to have any tickets in my pockets. So thank you. All right, next, 
Jordan Alberry. Uh, hi there. Yeah, so uh, my name is Jordan, and this week going into Resolve, so fun fact. Back at the end of December, early January, I surrendered my life to Christ, uh, like through ministry. So I surrendered myself to the ministry of God and whatever he called me to do, and uh, figured out that that would be through writing and speaking. So being up here is cool. Um, but going into this week, I was like, all right, God, I've surrendered myself, so let's see what you've got for me. Give me the next step. And he went, and the first night was, he was like, resolve to be honest. So he had us write down cards, and so often, not just as teenagers, but all of you, were hit with lies told by society and the world and social media and the news and everywhere, there's lies. And so he was like, listen, stop. Stop looking at those lies, because God specifically designed you. He designed you in every piece that you are, and he loves you. He thinks more precious thoughts toward you than there are grains of sand. And I mean... We live near the beach, there's a lot of sand. So it was easy to understand, well sort of, because it's really hard to fathom that he would actually love us and think that many precious thoughts towards us. So that first night it was be honest. And I was like, well I mean I'm already honest, whatever, yeah. And so we go and we were resolved to be ready. And second night something that hit me really big was uh, he talked about, he really went in depth of the, um, the crucifixion of Christ. And he talked about when Christ says, in our Bible it says that he said it is finished. But what he really said, like, when it's translated to us, it's it is finished. But what he said was to talistay. And that word is a word that back in Bible times, you would have your prisoners that would have debts, and they'd be in these jails and prisons. And whenever their debts were paid in full, to talistay would be written over their cells. So they'd be free. So to talistay means to really cover all that debt, which is what his death did for us. That was, like, it was mind-blowing how amazing, like everything that he says fits perfectly. So then we go to the third night and it was resolved to be different. And I, that's something that I've always strived to do during school is like, I'm like, well, I wanna be different. I wanna stand out, but I wanna stand out for Christ. And I was like, well, I mean, yeah, God, I'll, I'll, I'll write about that, okay, I see what you're saying. And then we get to the fourth night and everything sort of piled up and hit me because uh, Pastor Kevin talked about how so often he himself even, he thought that he was fully surrendered, but he was only 99% there. He had missed that last percent because he still had his own plans for his life and his own, his own ideas about what he was gonna do, his own goals. And I was like, wow, well that's me. I'm only 99% surrendered. So he was able to use that last night and allowed me to give up things that I knew weren't mine. So uh, during this camp, I became fully, actually, totally surrendered to Christ and what he has for me, and honestly, I wasn't sure how camp was going to go, but my life has been totally changed because of it. Thank you. All right, and you may think she moves like that because she's nervous. No, she just does that all the time. Uh, And last, and then I'll have, I'll finish up, is Elizabeth McGalliard. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I should have gone second. Um, um, so, I went into this weekend not really knowing who I was, and, sorry, um, and God just used Kevin to show me that I'm loved by Jesus, and he wants me in his life. <laughs> and... Um, and that, those, those nights were just so impactful because he really spoke to us through his testimony because he was able to show, like, what you don't want to get stuck doing and you can get out of anything because God forgives you for anything you've done and he loves you no matter what and he'll always accept you. And I thought I was, I mean, I know I was a Christian, but it just showed me to be completely surrendered, not just partly surrendered, but totally 100% surrendered. Now I am. Good job.
And, uh, and something that they didn't mention was uh, we called him Rev Kev all week. And so Rev Kev did an awesome job. And so a couple things that, that I want to say is um, a huge, huge, over-the-top thank you to my wife. Um, le- I legitimately say this. It wouldn't have happened without her. Um, they wouldn't have eaten. And, um, they, and she came in early, and she came back from the activities early to start cooking. And so I'm very thankful to her. Um, I really couldn't do what I do without her. Um, I'm thankful for our leaders as well. Uh, you know, they came in and uh, after work and, you know, stayed till late, late at night. And uh, it was just, it was, a, it was awesome. And uh, also to our church, uh, it wouldn't happen without you. And so I'm thankful uh, that you guys, I know some of you prayed for the camp and uh, that it would, it would be awesome, and it, and it was. Um, and then our pastor for just allowing us to have it. Um, that was a huge blessing for us. Setting up Tuesday through, uh, through his chaplain uh, ministry there at the police department. Uh, but then there's two guys. Uh, my wife was a huge part. Um, but if you saw the singing, um, I did not do any of that. Um, we had a great band that practiced. Uh, but James Wooten, uh, he put hours and hours and hours uh, of planning all of our music, printing it out. Uh, dealing with us as we asked so many questions. Uh, I asked him how many, I don't know how many times I asked him what key we were playing it in, what we were doing, and so I'm very thankful to James. And then um, if you saw that video and the logo and all of our artwork was done by Micah Turner, uh, extremely talented kid. I said, don't worry. I said, go to college. But I said, whenever I'm a pastor one day, don't worry, you have a job, okay? Because you're gonna come work for me and do all of that. And uh, I couldn't have done it. Uh, without anybody, uh, you know, Rachel was a huge part, James and Michael were a huge part, our leaders was a hu- were a huge part, and our pastor, of course, for just letting us do it. So I thank you, church, for allowing us to have that, praying for us, and uh, until next year, thank you. Thank you, young people, for those testimonies, and uh, Michael and Rachel and the team for putting that all together. A couple things I want to mention. One is he said this was his last camp. Well, we'll see how good his prayer life is because if we don't get another youth pastor, guess what? I'm going to hire his wife. Amen? Amen. Apparently, she did all, apparently she did all the work. But no, we know Brother Michael had a huge part in that. Uh, the second part is I already have contracts for Micah and J- uh, James, so sorry about your luck on that. All right? We have a farm club program here. We leak ahead. We, we work ahead. Uh, but uh, they did a great job, and uh, that video was very, very nice to see. Some of you probably never seen Bible Baptist Church from the air, amen? And as I saw it from the air, I was making a list for Paul. <laughs> oh. So we need to get that drone back here again and look at a few more things a little closer. Paul loves lists. He really does. If you were here Wednesday night, I preached about uh, getting all our ducks in a row, and I said the problem that we have is that just about the time we get all our ducks in a row here at Bible Baptist Church, the ducks have babies. So we have more ducks that we have to get in a row. But I'm so thankful, and this message tonight is about gratitude. I'm thankful that we were able to have something for the young people, especially in such an odd year as this, and that they responded and, and did well. Normally, we would partner with two or three, four churches together uh, and do something, uh, but I was excited. We didn't know. We didn't know if our kids would just want to do something on their own, if, they'd, if it would be successful, and uh, they had a great spirit and, and worked through all the hardships of, of this week, and I appreciate them very, very much. A strong group. Uh, this last couple years, and we got another big group coming up uh, next year. So praise the Lord for our young people. Amen? Amen. Well, in your Bibles tonight, notice uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I invite you to stand. And it's not a long message. You can thank me now or later. It's not a long message, but we're going to talk about the habit of gratefulness. The habit of gratefulness. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Verse 16, Paul begins a list of instructions and uh, commands, if you will, of about the Christian life and some attitudes that we should practice. And he says in verse 16, rejoice evermore. And then he says, pray without ceasing. And verse 18 is our key, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings. Prove all things, 
hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the verse from this morning, faithful is he that calleth you. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you and please be seated. Many years ago, maybe as much as 20 years ago, there was a best-selling book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Anybody remember that? Seven Habits of a ha- Highly Effective People. Well, some Christian author, I don't even know the name, uh, took off on that concept and used this title, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christians. And I'm not going to give you all seven, but it's a good book if you should come across it and, and uh, find the, the, uh, the themes, the seven things that he talked about. But the title, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christians, by definition, a habit is customary practice or use, an acquired behavior pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. So in something, for something to become a habit, it has to be practiced so often that it's almost, we would use the phrase, second nature, that, that it's, it's something you maybe don't even realize that you're doing because it's just your habit. Sometimes you can have good habits. Sometimes we have bad habits, not necessarily immoral habits, but just bad habits. Um, I've been fighting myself. Um, uh, this last few weeks, my wife pointed out, I've caught myself many times, and I don't know why I do it. I think it's because I talk and I'm in meetings all the time, and I go down lists, as we were just joking about with Brother Paul, and I go, I, I'm explaining things to people all the time, whether it's the salvation plan, one, two, three, four, you know, whether it's this is the agenda for the day, one, two, three, four. But I caught myself, but she's, she's pointed out many times, um, when I'm talking to her, I do it in list form. It's great communication. I mean, it's just very intimate, you know, one, two, three, four. And I catch myself saying, well, uh, you know what happened today? First of all, and I do this, and then second was this, and then third was this. And, and my point is, I say that a lot, don't I, Caden? I say that a lot. And it's just a habit I've fallen into. I don't know. Again, I think it's because my job is mostly talking. And so when you talk, you organize your thoughts, you organize your agenda, you, you, but you, that doesn't really transfer over into personal relationships, right? Uh, nobody wants to be talked to from a list. Amen? So habits can be good, habits can be uh, not so good, but to become a habit, it has to be something that's practiced. First of all, no, I'm just kidding. Let's look at the outline tonight. What about this word effective? So we have the habits of effective Christians. Well, the word effective means adequate to accomplish a purpose, producing the intended or expected result. So a habit is an acquired behavior pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. Effective means adequate to accomplish a purpose producing the intended or expected result. Now listen, friend, every Christian is saved the same way, amen? If you're saved, you're saved the same way. It may not have been saved at the same age, you weren't saved in the same place, you weren't saved in the same stage of life, but if you're saved today, you were saved through the blood of Jesus Christ by grace through faith in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's how you were saved. We're all saved the same way. He is our foundation. Another foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, Christ Jesus. That's in 1 Corinthians 3. Every Christian is sealed by the same Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So if you're saved, you were saved in the same manner as anybody else who's saved, And you're sealed by the same Holy Spirit that has sealed every child of God. And every Christian, at least in America, every Christian, at least in America, has access to a Bible and to a New Testament church. That's a blessing. Would to God that every nation could say that. But we have churches across America, I'm talking about before the pandemic, where you couldn't find people with a search warrant, and you've got nations that our missionaries are in that would do anything to have the chance to go to church. 
Isn't that something? So think about that. If we're all saved the same way, we're all sealed by the same Holy Spirit, and in America we all have access to a Bible and to a New Testament church, then what is the difference in how some Christians are confident, consistent, stable, trustworthy, faithful, and effective in their testimony? I'm not just talking about their attendance 52 Sundays out of the year. I'm talking about Christians who make a difference in the lives of those who know them. You know, you have Christians, I would, I would submit to you, you have Christians who are highly effective in their faith and in impacting other people. You, you have Christians, I would submit, who are neutral. They really are, they're, they're not uh, highly effective. They're, they're not impacting people for Christ. They're not uh, letting their light shine or using their words they're, just, they're saved, they're Christians, they're godly people, but they're not effective. You with me so far? And then you have some Christians who are saved, but they have a negative, a negative impact on the world because they are uh, maybe have a critical spirit. Uh, may, maybe they are involved in sin uh, that, that should not be so uh, among the people of God. And so they have those different levels of, of uh, effectiveness or impact. So some are negative. They do harm to Christ and to the body of Christ. Some have no effectiveness. Their presence is neutral. Their testimony is neutral. You you wouldn't know the difference uh, between them and an unsaved person. They're not necessarily immoral. They're not evil, uh, but they're not making an impact, okay? The salt has lost its savor. And then some Christians are highly effective, making a difference in their world, making a difference in their surroundings. What's, what, how, what is the difference there? What, what causes that? Well, there's no such thing as a super-Christian, amen? But there are such things as effective Christians. And I believe that if you study Christian men and women with this type of testimony of this effectiveness, you'll find some common characteristics. And, and we could make a whole series out of these effective uh, habits of effective Christians, but tonight our focus is on the habit of gratitude or gratefulness. And so let's notice what it means or what a difference we can make by being a grateful people. What is the effect of having Christians practice this habit of gratitude? Well, notice in verse 18, the apostle said, In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. One thing I see and I've learned is that effective Christians are consistently thankful people. They are a gracious people, and they are a grateful people. Notice, it doesn't say, for everything, give thanks, right? Right? Look at, the, look at the preposition. It's not for everything give thanks, but in everything give thanks. That's a world of difference. It's a little word, but it has a big meaning. In everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, there are some things it's hard to be, uh, to be thankful for. Amen? Amen? If you have any life experience, you know there are some difficult things that affect Christian people just as much as uh, non-Christian people. And there are difficult things to be thankful for. But there is nothing, according to the Scripture, that we can't be thankful in. Some of you aren't getting this. I don't want to start over. Amen or oh me. It's difficult to give thanks for some things, but we should be able to give thanks in those things. The Bible admonishes us to be thankful, and we're going to take a quick look through the book of Psalms. Start with me in verse 18, verse 49. We'll do rapid fire here, but Psalm 18, 49. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. That's for people who live in Washington. Amen? Notice Psalm 30, verse 12. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent, O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Psalm 50, verse 14. 
Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Psalm 75, verse 1. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near. Thy wondrous works declare. Psalm 92, verse 1. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. And now Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. In the building we built uh, in Ohio several years ago, uh, the auditorium is, is large. It seats 1,200 people. By comparison, this auditorium seats about 700. So it's about a 1,200-seat auditorium, and the ceiling is high like this, but the, the lobby is high. We've got a little lobby. You know, we really do. For a church this size, we've got a, a, a tiny lobby. And uh, I, I don't know what else to do about it, but right now it works out fine during COVID, right? Uh, because we've got half the people coming through, and, and they're not hanging around. They're supposed to be moving out in and out real quick. So it works out fine now. But when we have days of 800, 900, 1,000 again, and we will, and when we do that again, that little lobby is just a, a, little, a little small. So I'm not sure what we're going to do about that. But the lobby there is, is high. The ceiling in the lobby is as high as the ceiling in here. So above the doors as you come in, I had the words put up there right here, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And that was the, the verse that greeted folks as they entered into that worship space. And he says, with, be thankful unto him and bless his name. Keep going. Psalm 105, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. And then Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. It repeats again in these chapters. And then Psalm 147, verse 7. Sing unto the Lord with what, church? Thanksgiving, sing praise upon the harp unto our God. And then if you jump to the New Testament, where we were in Thessalonians, but notice Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Ephesians 5.20. Giving thanks always for all things. Notice. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then 1 Timothy 2.1, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now there are many more verses, but I wanted to just show you the intention of the Lord towards our attitude of thanksgiving. We are to be a thankful people. We are to be a grateful people. And so what is what is gratitude? What is gratefulness? And let me spend just a moment or two on that before we get to the second part of the message. What is this attitude of gratitude, if you will? That might help you remember it that way, an attitude of gratitude. Uh, notice, first of all, it is a personal and public attitude of appreciation for what God has done and is doing in my life. We sing the hymn, To God Be the Glory. Great things he hath done. Amen? To God be the glory. As I as illustrated this morning, his faithfulness is not because of you and me that he owes us anything. His faithfulness is not because we deserve a pat on the back. His faithfulness is because of who he is. And as grateful people, as a grati uh, people of gratitude, we understand that. We recognize that he is greatly to be praised. He is worthy of praise. And so it's a personal and public attitude of appreciation for what God has done and is doing in my life. Secondly, gratitude shows humility or humbleness. You know, the opposite of humility is pride or boastfulness. And so when I'm thankful, when I show gratitude to my Heavenly Father, it puts me in a position of humility. It, it, I'm, I'm recognizing, you see. When you deal with ungrateful people, when you deal with people who, who, who are not thankful, um, you, you'll find that they're prideful, that they're arrogant, that they uh, feel uh, more than they are, that, that, that they're, they're kind of expectant, amen? 
But when, when you respond in gratitude, then the person that's doing the blessing, the person that's providing the care, uh, it, it embraces that attitude, you see. But the Bible says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So when I'm thankful, when we just simply, uh, even something as simple as, as, as thanking the Lord for our food, okay, very simple. We, it's a habit, right? Should be. Uh, if it only happens in your house at Thanksgiving, <laughs> uh, then that's not a good habit. But even something that simple recognizes, and I, it doesn't matter what the food is. It could be McDonald's, and you really need to pray before you eat McDonald's. Lord, bless this food, or whatever it is. Amen? So just something as simple as that shows humility. It shows appreciation. And the opposite of humility is pride. Notice 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. When we are thankful, it shows that we recognize God's gifts and we recognize God's moving in our lives. And so when we give thanks in all things, like verse 24 tells us in our text, when we give thanks in all things, or verse 18 rather, good or bad, we acknowledge that God is in control, that he knows best, and that we are his servants. You know, when we're ungrateful, even when bad things happen and we're not grateful to God, it's almost as if we're accusing him of being derelict in his duty. God, how could you let this happen? Versus, God, thank you for being with me through this situation. Do you see the difference? I don't understand it. I don't like it, but I can be thankful knowing that you're, you're not going anywhere, amen? You're faithful, and I thank you for this trial because I know that you're going to bring a blessing. God will make this trial a blessing. So this attitude of being thankful versus accusing God. We may not verbalize our accusation, but we may certainly feel that in our heart if we're not right in our spirit when the trial comes. And so we have this accusation of God. God, you shouldn't have let this happen. God, uh, you let me down. God, you, you uh, uh, missed the mark here. Versus being thankful that he's ever present with us. We recognize God's gift and we recognize his spirit moving. We acknowledge that he's in control and that he knows best and that we are his servants and not our own. I, I think I referenced the man Job last Sunday night when we talked about our praise should rise above. How that he said, uh, I, I, shall I not receive, uh, I've received good from the Lord, shall I not also receive bad? And he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was being grateful even though he had lost all of those things that he had suffered. Wow. We rec when we give thanks in all things, we rec we're, we're acknowledging that we are his servants. He's in control. He's the master. He's the Lord. And we are not our own. We are bought with a price. Amen? And we're not our own. So gratitude is a personal and public attitude of appreciation. Don't just be grateful internally. Be grateful externally. Don't just be grateful internally. I, I, I don't have a hundred mark on this. This kind of scares me. We don't have this, at least in the little town in Ohio we live in. But when you uh, come to a restaurant in Savannah, there's usually a report card of some kind outside the window. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all don't pay any attention, do you? Okay. <laughs> well, it may say 85%. Not good. It may say 97%. And I was at one place, and it did say 100% on the window. And I thanked the lady. I said, man, that's awesome. She said, what are you talking about? She didn't even know where the 100 was. 
Well, I can't say that I have a hundred when it comes to this, but I've tried to be a grateful person. I've tried to send thank you notes. I've tried to acknowledge when people do kind things uh, for me or our family. I try. I, I'm sure I've missed several or over the years. I, I've not been a hundred percent, but it's not just inwardly grateful. We need to express that gratefulness. Amen? Glory to God. Thanks to the Lord. To demonstrate and to share, I, as I shared some of those blessings this morning, uh, I, I pray that that was received with the right attitude because I'm just trying to brag on the, the God of heaven, amen? I'm trying to brag on the, the head of the church and the Savior of the body, the one who's in control of all things. And so we don't just want to hold that in, we want to share that. We want to tell and publish the blessings of God in our life. Be grateful personally and publicly be thankful for what God is doing. So gratitude, again, as God can use praise, we talked about last Sunday night, God can use gratitude, the mindset, to cause you and me to be effective Christians. Now being unthankful on the reverse of that thing, being unthankful puts you in some bad company. Did you know that? Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and Paul talks about the perilous times. In the last days, he calls them perilous times. But I want you to see what being unthankful, what kind of company you're in. <laughs> it's not good. He said, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. That's not a list you want to be on, amen? And it is a characteristic. I find it fascinating because people have been unthankful for, for millennia, but notice it's one of the hallmarks of the last days. People unthankful for their country. Uh-oh. People unthankful for our military. People unthankful for our police officers. People unthankful for the extra $600 a week of unemployment they're getting. Try to find that somewhere else on this globe. Just try to find that somewhere else on this globe. And burn the flag of the country that's paying your bills. Don't get me started. I'm thankful I can preach that. <laughs> it's interesting that it's one of the signs of the last days, isn't it? Unthankful. Unthankful. If you're getting $25 million a year to catch a ball, you ought to be thankful. I got to get back to the message. And you can send that to any team in America, and I'll sign it. Unthankful, unholy, covetous, boasters, proud. I don't want to be in that number, amen? I don't want to be named among that list. And so gratitude is an attitude or mindset that God can use. What does gratitude do? Here's the second half of the message if you're keeping track. What does gratitude do? First of all, it keeps God's blessings on my life. I've said it this way over the years. Unthankful people will soon have nothing to be thankful for. Unthankful people will soon have nothing to be thankful for. When we start taking things for granted or out of entitlement, and see how long we have them. Could be your job, could be your wife, could be your family, could be your health, could be your freedoms, could be your country. You take it for granted long enough, you're unthankful long enough. And I'm certainly not a prophet, but I think America is going to re, uh, regret the day when we threw away our freedoms to embrace socialism. If the Lord tarries long enough, 
There will be a generation of Americas who will only wish they had what we have now. In all of its imperfections, in all of its problems, they'll wish that they didn't throw away what God blessed us with here. When you start taking things for granted, you won't have them long. You know, I've come to enjoy God's blessings in my life. I really have. My pastor that uh, just passed away, Dr. Smith, he said this, and I guess you could, you could make a theological argument against it one way or the other, but it was his, was his strong position that the blessings of God follow a person, that they're, they're personal. Whether it was Abraham, whether it was Jacob, whether it was David, how that God blessed Israel for David's sake. David had been long dead and gone, but God told Solomon and others, for David's sake. And so he preached that the blessings of God follow the man. And I've come to enjoy God's blessings. And I don't want them to dry up. I want to keep on experiencing the blessings of God. Like Gypsy Smith who said, I've never lost the wonder of it all. I want to enjoy my salvation. I want to enjoy my family. I want to enjoy the provisions of the Lord. As the verse said, be thankful unto him and bless his name. So what does gratitude do? Number one, it keeps God's blessings on my life. Number two, it brings glory to God. In my blessings, thanking God brings him glory and praises his name. Everything I have Everything I enjoy in life is because of Him. It's because of Him. I'm not a self-made man. I'm a God-made man. Keep self out of it. Amen? That a man said that to me, and he meant it as a compliment because I didn't go to Bible college and because I didn't go to cemetery, seminary. Yeah. He said, you're a self-made preacher. I said, I don't want to be a self-made preacher. I don't want to be a self-made preacher. I want to be a God-made preacher. To have the blessing of God and the anointing of God and the Spirit of God on the ministry. All the blessings I have is because of Him, my church, my wife, my children, my health, uh, every blessing, all the things we take for granted. It's all to the glory of God. In my burdens, giving him thanks. You say, preachers have burdens? Uh, just count. <laughs> Some Sunday. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, the shepherd bears the burdens of the sheep. But in our burdens, giving him thanks shows, again, gratitude that he is in control. Remember, in everything, give thanks. It shows gratitude that he's in control and he knows what's best for me, which then brings him honor and glory. If God, listen, God doesn't just want our praise, as I said last Sunday night, in the good times, but also in the rough times. Paul talked about that when he mentioned the thorn in the flesh. Remember 2 Corinthians 12. We're hastening here. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. This is the thorn in the flesh. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So this is a burden. This is something that was hard to give thanks for. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. He didn't want it. You see that? People say the Bible's hard to understand. Go back to that verse for a second. Is that hard to understand? For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, means three times, that it might depart from me. It's very clear Paul didn't want it. He didn't consider it a blessing. He didn't consider that it was helping him. And he wanted it gone. Verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Notice the change of attitude. Automatic here. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And keep going. 
Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. May I paraphrase for you in verse number 10. He said, thank the Lord. If God has determined that it's best for me to have this burden, then praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Giving thanks in my burdens shows my gratitude and that He is in control. I'm grateful that God, uh, God didn't say, oh, Paul, I've abandoned you during that time. He said, no, I want you to have that. I've decided it would be best for you. And so Paul said, yes, sir. If you've decided it's best, then I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to glory in my infirmities. I'm going to recognize that, that even in hard, hardship and hard times, your power is upon me and I'm going to be grateful for the presence of God. What does gratitude do? It keeps God's blessings on my life and it brings glory to God. And then in closing, so how do I do it? How do I become uh, a grateful person? How do I do that? Let me give you three quick things and we'll be done. Number one, it needs to become a habit. Gratitude needs to become a habit. Now remember, how do you make something a habit? It is something that is a pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. And I don't mean to be ugly, but there are Christians who have not developed this habit. Gratitude has to be pulled out of them. Okay? Gratitude has to be forced. You've not got to the place of a habit yet. Okay? It should come easily. It should come seamlessly. It should come quickly. It is a pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. So we shouldn't have to think, should I be grateful for this or should I not be grateful for this? Now, sometimes things catch us off guard and we have to do an attitude check, right? We have to do an attitude adjustment. And I find that the more spiritually mature people are, the shorter that time is of attitude adjustment. You with me? Because we're all guilty of it. We all, things come up, think, unexpected things, unhappy things, difficult things, and, and we're all caught off guard. And so if we're not careful, uh, we'll focus on the problem instead of having the gratitude attitude. But a sign of spiritual maturity is you make the adjustment quickly. You make the adjustment quickly. The, the sooner you make the adjustment uh, shows how more, much more in tune you are with the Spirit of God the longer it takes you to make the adjustment, the, more, the, the, the farther you are in your spiritual journey uh, of growth. You need to grow. So it needs to become a habit. Practice, 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 practice. I, I can only imagine what my parents went through when I started learning to play the piano. I started taking lessons. My older sister was taking lessons, and I, uh, I showed some interest, evidently. I was about five years old. And uh, when she would get done practicing, I would go over and I would play what she had been playing from the book, but I would play it without the book. And I play most of the music that I play by ear. And uh, so because my parents noticed that, um, they got me started on some lessons. And I did lessons for a while. And uh, do you know um, what goes around comes around, right? So I practiced the piano, and I'm sure it was horrendous for my parents to have to listen to that over and over and over again. And uh, I did that to them. And now, just in, recently, someone gave my daughter a violin. <laughs> no one in our family plays the violin. But I'm old enough to remember a man named Jack Benny and to hear the tuning of that violin. And so I know now what my parents went through or I'm getting, I'm fixing to, as you all would say here, I'm fixing to learn. But that practice, that practice, that practice. And guess what? Now I can hear a song, maybe for the first time, 
And I can go to the piano and I can pick out the melody of that song and before long add chords and things and put some, some semblance of a song together. I can do that. But it started with practice. It was a habit. You follow me? Every day. There were days I practiced an hour a day. As soon as school was over, an hour a day, an hour a day, an hour a day. And just like anything that you want to become proficient at or effective at, you've got to practice. Do you know why I'm a terrible golfer? I mean terrible. I mean awful. It's because Kaiser only takes me once a year. That's the, that's the reason. My friends in Ohio, they say, oh, you live down in Savannah and Hilton Head. There's some of the, the country's best golf courses. There's golf courses everywhere. I said, I've golfed three times since I've lived here. Three times. you got to practice. I remember a guy in Ohio was trying to teach me, and after about the third time he said, you know, preacher, he said, you'd save a lot of money if you'd just go to the driving range. <laughs> Mark Evans. He, he said, don't worry about playing nine holes. Just go, take your money and go to the driving range. It would save you. It, you'd be a good steward of God's resources if you didn't play golf. Amen. you got to practice. So you got to make gratitude a habit. Practice this week ahead. Practice this month of August, maybe. This is one of the things that uh, the, the law enforcement project was a good example of, is, is to, to be proactive in showing gr gratitude. To say, hey, we thank you. And, and make this an attitude uh, adjustment. Make this a habit uh, be, be more outspoken in your thankfulness. Be, be more, uh, uh, work for that 100% mark uh, in your gratitude, okay? When someone does a kindness, you don't have to do a handwritten note, but be, be sure that you're thankful and you express that thanks. Make it a habit. Start being thankful for what God does for you. Number two, tell the Lord what you're thankful for and tell others what you're thankful for. Tell the Lord what you're thankful for and tell others what you are thankful thankful for. Our friends, our family, our employees, uh, our spouses, our children, uh, tell people, tell, uh, tell what the Lord has done for you. That's what Jesus told that man that he healed of the demons, remember? He said, I want to go with you, take me with you. And Jesus said, no, go home to your friends and tell them what great things God has done for you. Tell them. And so to, to be thankful, to brag. I, I, um, I think it's Jesse Wilder. I think it's his, but he parked out here this morning. And as I, I drove out, or, well, I drove out, yeah, I drove out. I walked out the door to the driveway, and there's Jesse's car. And on the back, uh, he has a bumper sticker. And it says, I love my wife. I thought, man, that'll preach. Just a simple bumper sticker. I love my wife. Now, if you're a woman driving that car, you've got a lot of explaining to do. But as a man, that's a good bumper sticker. And it's just telling. He's just bragging, just saying, hey, God's blessed me. And we need to be thankful and we need to, to tell people how much we love one another, how much God has done for us. And that, number three, is demonstrate. So we've got to make it a habit. We've got to practice it. We've got to tell it. And then finally, we need to demonstrate it. Show what you're thankful for. Show what you're thankful for. I had a little poem. I don't have it memorized. I used to have a lot more memorized before I fell off that ladder. Well, I didn't fall off the ladder. The ladder broke. We won't rehearse all that. But in some ways, I used to remember a lot more. I, can't, I don't know. If, I'm at that point. I'm at that magic line, Larry Howell, where I'm not sure if it's accident-related or age-related. Age-related? Yeah. Yeah. It could be. I saw a shirt that said, I thought growing old would take longer. Well, the little poem said something about this. And I, I can't rhyme it. I can't remember it. But the, the, the last part was this. I'd rather have a rose today than a truckload when I'm dead. I'd rather have a rose today than a truckload when I'm dead. What, what, what's the moral of that story? Show thanksgiving. Show gratefulness. Show love and kindness and respect 
today. I have a pastor friend in Ohio, uh, he would sign all of his letters, he'd sign the letters, and then he put um, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and and then he wrote this, no regrets, exclamation point. No regrets. And that was his motto, to live his life with no regrets, so that when the trumpet sounds or when the Lord called him home, whichever happened first, he'd be going out with no regrets. That's a great testimony, amen? Demonstrate what you're thankful for. If you're thankful for your family, show them that you're thankful. If you're thankful for your church, hey, let's take care of it. Let's support it. I'm chomping at the bit to to get this place filled up again. I know we're not ready for that. I know it takes some time, but but man, oh man, I I, I just... uh, Excited about the day. You know, we, we're so used to, you understand half the seats are missing. When we get to put the seats back in, some of you aren't going to know what to do. It's going to seem crowded again, isn't it? And it'll be a while. We're going to do two services at least to the end of the year, but we've had to change friend day. One of the reasons we had to change friend day is because you can't right now invite a thousand people at one time. Not supposed to do that. And then feed that thousand people because if you feed them, they will come. <laughs> we can't do that right now. But I'm anxious for when we can get, uh, get back to our uh, aggressive visitation and advertising. We haven't advertised anything. We haven't sent out flyers. We have, we've just been holding steady. But let's take care of the church. Let's provide for the church. Let's build up the church. If you're thankful for your salvation, tell others how to be saved. I had not heard about that ticket illustration that was used at camp. That's a great illustration. Give out the tickets. Lift up the cross. Lift up the name. If you're thankful for your salvation, let's support missions. Let's give so that they might go. So demonstrate is what I'm trying to say. To develop this habit of gratefulness. We've got to demonstrate it. We've got to practice it. And as we develop a thankful heart and a spirit of gratitude, we're going to have a positive impact and be effective in the lives of other people. Remember that definition of effective means adequate to accomplish a purpose, producing the intended or expected result. Here's my prayer We who are saved have a lot to be thankful for. Our church has a lot to be thankful for. But our time is so precious. My prayer is that I don't want to have a negative effect on people as a child of God. And I don't want to have a neutral effect. Amen? I want to have a high impact for good. And one of the ways, just one of the ways, is to demonstrate a thankful spirit, to be a grateful people. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. Even in the midst of this pandemic, I'm thankful that we're having church. Even though we couldn't do a great summer camp like the kids are used to, I'm thankful that not only did they do what they did, but it was very effective. It was very impactful. I'm thankful that in our church, the bills are all paid and the ink is all black. Amen. And I'm thankful for every family that calls this church their home. Even those of you who are watching and cannot yet come, we miss you, but please understand, we, we understand completely If you cannot come and should not come, we get that. But we still miss you. And we're thankful for you. Thankful for this facilities that the Lord has given. Thankful for the legacy that built this church to what it is today. We've got a lot to be grateful for. Amen? And I guess one of the best ways to say it is uh, we shouldn't just wait till Thanksgiving season to be a thankful people. It should be a habit. It should come as second nature. You know, when our... I can't come down. We're on TV. Sorry. 
We preach three times a day. I get all jumbled up and don't remember where we're at, but it's okay. Um, I've, sa- I've shared this before, but as a parent, it's, it's kind of a neat milestone when you don't have to tell your kids to say thank you to somebody. You with me? So somebody gives them a card or somebody gives them, you know, a dollar bill or somebody does something nice for them and you say, what do you say? You remember that, parents? You understand what I'm saying? It, and you have to do that for a while. That's part of the training. That's part of the practice. But when they do it on their own, and sometimes we're still waiting for that bridge to be crossed. <laughs> but when they do it on their own, that, that, that's a special day. When you don't have to remind them. It's become so ingrained. It's become such a part of their habits that, that they say thank you or they're, they're very grateful on their own without any prompting from mom and dad. Isn't that wonderful? And I think there's a spiritual component to that too. That when we become a thankful people without, without the Holy Spirit having to convict us about it, without the Holy Spirit having to prompt us about it, that it just comes second nature, second nature, second nature, being thankful. I won't mention his name, but I was out with uh, some of the college kids two weeks ago, and I shared this with my wife because we were still trying to teach some in our uh, kids. And um, the young man, e- every time the waitress came by and offered him something, uh, he would say, please and thank you. And he said it just like that. I'd never heard that before. Just, it was just automatic. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. In other words, he didn't wait for her to finish. Do you want some more tea? Uh, Please. And then she poured it and then he said, thank you. He just went ahead and preemptively said, please and thank you. I don't know if that's a southern thing. I don't know if that's something his parents taught him. I I don't know. But it just, he said it probably half a dozen times during the dinner uh, to the the waitress. And I thought, man, that's, that's the attitude right there, isn't it? That's a, it shows humility, please, and gratitude, thank you. And it's all in one, one comment. And so that attitude of gratefulness, you and I need to develop that. We need to practice it. And we need to use it, demonstrate it, amen, to be a thankful people. It'll make you more effective. It'll give you more of an impact as a child of God. When unsaved people see God's people being ungrateful and unthankful, um, number one, we're setting the wrong example, and number two, we're taking away from God's glory by having that kind of a spirit. So habits of effective Christians, at least this one, being grateful. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we are thankful tonight. I am thankful as the pastor of this great church to be here, to even have our doors open and to uh, be able to preach publicly. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for the online services, but there's just something about God's people being together where two or more are gathered in my name, Jesus said, there am I in the midst of them. And so we thank you for your presence and for your spirit. And tonight, Lord, I pray that we would all examine our hearts and lives and recent events and recognize, Lord, how good you have been and how faithful you are and that we would be a thankful people. It would come second nature. Uh, Lord, an automatic response to, to be grateful. Help us to have that habit and to develop it to tell others about the goodness of the Lord, to share our thanks with our family and friends. And Lord, not to be prideful, but to have a spirit of humility and recognize that every good and perfect gift is from above, and we owe it all to you. We owe it all to you. Bless this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and join us as we sing? Jesus is calling is the song. Just a couple verses. Just a couple verses, and we'll be done. The altar's open for prayer and decision tonight. Jesus is calling. Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today, calling today.
Why from the sunshine of love will you roll farther and farther away? Verse. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him your burden and you shall be blessed. He will not turn you away. Please remain standing. Thank you so much for being with us throughout the day. And those of you watching at home, we are glad that you've joined us. And uh, we appreciate the comments and the uh, notes and letters. And uh, thank you for tuning in. We'll keep doing this as long as we, as we need to do it on Sundays. And uh, let me just invite you back for Wednesday night. We are doing Bible study uh, one more time here, at least in the auditorium. We'll update you as to any changes in the future on that. But this Wednesday night here in the auditorium, and um, uh, we will be starting some new expansion, Lord willing, if there's no major setbacks. And we have heard some good news on the... Uh, on the